The History of Lenore and Caldwell County Theaters, Part 2. Thanks so much to Dr. Gary Boy for his excellent research on these theaters. About Dr. Boy, my interest in early film exhibition began with research into the early history of country music surrounding Doc Watson. Movie theaters often doubled as venues for live performances and country musicians were common fare for the northwestern North Carolina area. In my research, I compiled detailed notes of every available local paper from Caldwell and surrounding counties, primarily Watauga, and along the way I realized I had gathered information on theater openings and closings as well as their exhibition histories that would be valuable in a context outside my work in music. So I have detailed information on all the theaters that I will update over the coming weeks. A word of warning, like Will Rogers, all I know is what I read in the papers. I am not a local. I'm originally from Atlanta, although my father's family comes from Bluff City, Tennessee, so I don't claim to have any inside knowledge on these places. I have visited many of them, or rather what is left of them, although I've never seen a movie in Caldwell County outside my home there. So most of this information comes from the trade periodicals and the Lenore Topic, Lenore News, and the Lenore News Topic. Some of it aligns closely to accepted knowledge in other sources, some of it doesn't. I've tried to document my sources carefully, and of course, this is a work in progress. I'm currently up to 1948 in the news topic, so I will be adding more and more information as I go. Early Roller Skating Before exploring the dramatic and cinematic history of the Hinkle Opera House, some mention must be made about the alternate planned use of the space as a skating rink. Although it seems unlikely today, there are references to ice skating around Lenore as early as 1876. Lenore Topic 12-14-1876, page 4. Certainly, the climate for this type of recreation was too warm for the majority of the year, but the mountains north of Lenore provided a longer, colder winter season, and ice skating was common there. Just a few years later, roller skating became popular in town, just as it was throughout the country. Roller skates are becoming quite plentiful around Lenore. Certain mysterious noises indicate that there is a rink in our midst. Where is it? Lenore Topic, 1124-1881, page 1. Various buildings around town were used as small roller skating rinks, through the 1880s and 1890s, and ice skating continued to be enjoyed in the wintertime as well. Skating as a healthy exercise is mentioned in this humorous note. Ladies imagine that roller skating is a fine way to work off superfluous flesh. The belief seems well founded. One young lady dropped 127 pounds at the rink recently and dropped it hard. Lenore News Topic 521-1884, page 4. The references to skating parties or rinks are common enough that it is easy to see how Hinkle envisioned a part of his new building being used for roller skating. Even before the building had hosted a theatrical event, it was opened to a skating party. Local and personal. The Opera House people had a special attraction at the skating rink Wednesday night. A good Italian band consisting of violin, harp, and cornet furnished good music for a large audience. Lenore News 12 20, 1907, page 3. This may have been just a concert or, in a more familiar modern types of roller skating, the music might have been used as an accompaniment for the skaters. Other notices are less ambiguous about the music accompanying the skaters. Some of the old-time fiddlers added much to the pleasure of the people at the skating rink last Saturday night. 
Five or six of them were present and dispersed some fine music. Lenore News, 114-1908, page 3. A masquerade skating dance was held in March of that year along with a tacky party where a prize was given to most unfashionably dressed skaters. A rare reference to African-American musicians also comes from this period, local and personal. Sam Meeks, colored with a band of four other colored men, were here last week and furnished some unusually good stream music. They played at the skating rink and were serenaded at several places in town where the music was much enjoyed. Lenore News, 331-1908, page 3. By the fall of 1908, skating had apparently ousted film exhibition in the hall, although it would continue to be used for theatrical and vaudeville entertainments. Caldwell County, North Carolina, has a rich history of cinematic exhibition. As early as 1897, a traveling show with a projecting kinescope exhibited in the courthouse. Even earlier than this, magic lantern shows could be seen in other temporary venues around town. A more permanent local provider of moving picture shows began at the Hinkle Opera House in January of 1908, leading to several short-lived attempts at commercial film exhibition around town throughout the 1910s and 1920s. There were outdoor theaters, theaters in tents, theaters in stores, theaters in opera houses, even African-American theaters. Most of these businesses advertised relatively little in the newspapers and trade publications of the day. So little will ever be known about them, but taken together, even small snippets of information create a larger picture of the early silent cinema in a southern town. By the 1940s, the movies had become big business in Lenore, and there were as many as five movie theaters in town. Weekly, then daily ads in the Lenore news topic gave us a much better idea of the cinematic taste of the town and the role of each venue. A surprising amount of this history survives today. The Opera House and its stage are nearly unchanged from its heyday over 100 years ago. The Universal State Theater and the Center Theater are also still recognizable. From the interior in the former case and exterior interior in the latter, although both have long been closed to the public. There are other buildings that have survived in completely gutted form, and nothing of their use as theaters are known to survive. Still others, like the Avon Theater and the Harshaw Building, have been demolished and replaced with other structures, in these cases a courthouse extension and a parking lot. The early theaters were often located in buildings not intended for exhibition, these are listed here by both names of the theater and the buildings in which they were located. Later theaters, such as the Avon and Center, are in buildings designed for film exhibition and listed here only by their theater name. The building is the theater, in other words. When possible, early maps will locate the buildings precisely. I hope to add more and more information in the future and proceed more or less chronologically from the early period into at least the 1950s. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions, corrections, or useful addition. Here is the courthouse, shown 1897-1923, and also the Hinkle Opera House, January 1908-October 1917. Almost completely forgotten about today, the Cloyd and Johnson building on East Main Street hosted a movie theater for nearly a year from October 1908 until September 1909. Like most early theaters, it was not designed or built for film exhibition, rather it was originally intended for a general store. This large brick building had opened in 1892, the Lenore Topic, T 
1026, 1892, page 3, and housed the Cloyd and Johnson General Store until it was sold to Theodore Kincaid in 1908. And the reference to that is Lenore News 1 7, 1908, page 3. Kincaid operated the store only briefly before moving to another location. By May of 1908, the A.V. Miller Furniture Store and the Lenore Realty and Insurance Company were the new tenants, Lenore Topic 513-1908, page 2, and the Lenore News 417-1908, page 3. In the fall of 1908, the film exhibitions taking place in the Opera House across the street were moved into the building. Of local interest, the moving picture exhibitions which have been given in the Opera House will hereafter be given in the Cloyd and Johnson building on the first floor adjoining the office of the Lenore Realty and Insurance Company. The Opera House will be used as a skating rink. Lenore Topic 1021-1908, page 3. The disposition of Miller's Furniture Store, that autumn appears to be in question. He sells the business in December to the Lenore Hardware and Furniture Company. Lenore Topic 12-2-1908, page 3. So he may have already cleared out his business stock at the time the theater equipment arrived. In any case, a theater at this time was relatively portable. A little more than a projector, screen, folding chairs, and perhaps a piano. The buildings are shown here in combination of several period maps with their dates of film exhibition. This shows the Cloyd and Johnson building, October 1908 through September 1909. How much space the new picture show occupied on the first floor of the building is unknown but it coexisted with the real estate and insurance office, as noted above, and seemed immediately popular. Local and personal, the moving picture shows have been moved into the Lenore Realty and Insurance Building, where a nice room has been fitted up for the entertainments. The shows are well patronized and seem to be increasing in popularity. They are well worth the small price of admission. Lenore News, 10-30-1908, page 3. With its own space dedicated to movies, rather than having to share space with the wide variety of uses of the opera house, such as roller skating, the show could go on more frequently, even nightly, except on Sunday, of course, of local interest. The new quarters for the moving picture exhibitions in the Cloyd and Johnson building have been completed and the shows are given there every night. They now have up-to-date equipment and the pictures are interesting and instructive. Lenore Topic 1028-1908, page 3. Little more than general terms such as interesting and instructive are ever applied to films in this building. In 1909, there are still relatively few films in existence, and most of these were shorts of no more than 10 minutes. It was apparently enough to advertise that moving pictures were being shown and the novelty itself would bring out a sizable audience in a smaller town. There are no named films advertised at the Electrical Theater throughout its run at the old Cloyd and Johnson building. The shows seem to have been operated by the Opera House owners initially, but shortly afterwards, exhibition is taken over by two otherwise unidentified young men by the names of Hefner and Lentz, Lenore Topic, 1223-1908, Supplement, page 1. In March of 1909, the business office again transferred hands, this time to a Lee Carlton. By April of 1909, the theater acquired a tentative new name. Additional locals. Mr. T. Lee Carlton, manager of the Electric Theater. 
is giving some splendid motion picture shows, and we are glad to say they are well patronized. Lenore News, 420-1909, page 2. Carlton had found a relatively unique and cost-effective means of advertising in the lost and found section of the paper. Business locals found the place to spend a happy hour. The moving picture show has changed their film services and have the best pictures that can be obtained. New scenes every night, also the best piano and vocal music. Come out and enjoy yourself for one hour. T.L. Carlton Manager, Lenore News, 413-1909, page 3. The next month, electrical was substituted in the notices on the venue and thereafter would be called by that name. By May, the show was successful enough to hire out a four-piece orchestra locally, the Lenore Orchestra. It is very gratifying to all those who are interested in music and the uplifting of the town to know that an orchestra comprising of the following gentlemen has been formed. H.L. Baldwin, cornetist and manager, Edwin Cloyd, violinist, N.H. McCrary, bass violin, and Hardy Turner, pianist. It is pleasing to know that there has been a hearty response in support of the orchestra being engaged to play for a certain number of nights each week at the Electrical Theater and the popular store of the Lenore Drug Company. Lenore News, 514-1909, page 3. Live music was a virtual part of the silent cinema, not only for atmosphere during the films, but also between, as reels were changed and to rest the eyes of the audience, little accustomed to the electrical entertainments. This theater was also an early example of another component of early film exhibition, the illustrated song, singing in front of projected slides, provided the early 20th century audience with two elements missing in the motion picture program, sound and color. Even before Carlton took over the business, slides were being used at the electrical. The pictures are interesting and instructive as well as entertaining. The illustrated song slides are beautiful hand-painted and show up well. The moving picture show is worthy of your patronage. Lenore Topic 113, 1909, page 3. Many early projectors of the period had separate slide projectors that could be used for such songs while the films were being rewound on the other half of the machine. Later that year, Carlton advertised both the best piano and vocal music. Lenore News, 413-1909, page 3, as well as Rumble the Fiddler doing unspecified stunts between films. Lenore News, 716-1909, page 3. For a recreated early performance of an illustrated song from 1909, see Goodbye Girly and Remember Me from the Documenting the American South website at UNC. By September, Carlton had secured another larger venue for the theater, the Harshaw Building, diagonally across from the old Cloyd and Johnson storehouse. Local and personal, Mr. T. Lee Carlton moved his electrical theater to the Harshaw Building yesterday. Mr. Carlton found it necessary to secure larger quarters for his picture show and now has a much better and more comfortable place. The room has recently been cleaned and remodeled to suit his business and his patrons will find the new room more satisfactory in many ways. Lenore News, 9-7-1909, page 3. At first glance, this building seems to be a bit smaller than the old location, so obviously the new building must have had a larger space for film exhibition, possibly the entire floor. The movements of the picture show from the Opera House to the Cloyd and Johnson building and then to the Harshaw building are summarized in the following map. The Harshaw building, September 1909, 
to March 1914. By 1910, the Cloyd and Johnson building was converted to My Store on the Square, another general store by J.H. Smith of Greenville, South Carolina, and then the Machine Mercantile Company, just a couple of years later, Lenore Topic, 11 9 1910, page 3 in the Lenore News, 119 1912, page 3. In April 1917, the Bolding Turner Wholesale Grocery Company took over the building, Lenore News, 420 1917, page 1, as seen on the 1921 Sanborn map followed by a variety of other businesses, but never again a movie theater. At the Harshaw Building, the electrical theater flourished and became one of the several short-lived but important film theaters in this building. I'd like to add that our Caldwell Heritage Museum, 112 Vaden Street, Lenore, North Carolina, has now acquired all the old news topics that our local library had, so research on these theaters could actually be done in the original copies of the news topic at our museum. In early 20th century parlance, the term opera house was used as a euphemism for what would generally be called a theater, a term that carried with it vague notions of shady and tenorant actors and unsavory show people. Actual performance of opera in the European tradition was always the exception in these American opera houses. Opera consisted of high-class entertainment for the well-to-do, so the association with the elite culture helped divert town censorship. The more common entertainment included theatrical works with or without music, vaudeville, minstrel shows, concerts, dances, and anything requiring a stage and room for a large audience. Lenore's largest neighbor to the south, Hickory, built an opera house in 1890. Lenore News Topic, 1-8-1890, page 2. And the state capitol in Raleigh opened one in 1884. Lenore Topic, 10-8-1884, page 2. In addition to a variety of entertainments offered, Many early opera houses also served a variety of other purposes for the town. The opera house in Chester, South Carolina, for example, doubled as the city hall. There is no indication that the opera houses in Chester and Hickory, on the same railroad line as Lenore, were the immediate inspiration of Lenore's opera house, but it seems likely. Having a large entertainment venue was the mark of an up-and-coming town in the era. Lenore's was planned and built during 1907 by Columbus Vance Hinkle, 1867 through 1926, and opened in early 1908. The Hinkle Opera House was first and foremost a livery stable, as an early notice makes evident, local and personal. The work on the large new brick stables of the Hinkle Livestock Company is progressing nicely and the building when completed will be quite an ornament to the town. The building will be four stories high in part and three in part and two the remainder. The first floor will be used as offices for large storage apartments for vehicles while the basement in the rear will be fitted with stalls for horses. The offices of the company will have a plate glass front and be finished in nice style and furnished with comfortable and convenient furnishing throughout. The third floor will be in hardwood and the room used as a skating rink and opera hall. Taking it all in all, this is one of the greatest improvements made in our town in some time. Lenore News, 7-5-1907, page 3. The phrase skating rink and opera hall may startle some modern readers, but would not have been unprecedented at the time. Roller skating crazes peaked in America several times from the 1880s well into the 20th century, 
and skaters needed a large flat wooden floor that could easily be filled with folding chairs when not in use as a rink. More specific details on the construction can be gleaned from a slightly later clipping. Hinkle Opera Building The Hinkle Livestock Company is just finishing one of the most handsome and most convenient buildings to be found in this part of the country. The first floor or basement is conveniently arranged to stable and accommodate the large number of horses the firm is at times called upon to handle and stable. The ground floor is arranged with plate glass front for the accommodation and display of the large line of vehicles the firm carries. In the rear of this splendid room is a broad stairway leaning up to the offices which occupy a large gallery extending clear across the rear of the building. This office is particularly well ventilated and lighted by large plate glass windows with northern exposure. The open space between the office and the main vehicle room will be filled with sliding glass windows so that the whole lower floor or vehicle room may be seen from the office. The third or top floor is arranged for an opera house. A large stage with 26 foot opening is built across the rear of the building and will be supplied with an attractive and modern equipment of curtains and sliding screens and ample dressing rooms. The floor is double and laid in hardwood and the room will be fitted with folding chairs and will accommodate a thousand to twelve hundred people. The building is finished throughout with ornamental steel ceiling and native pine oiled. The building is amply supplied with electric lights and all in all will do credit to a city of 50,000 inhabitants. A skating rink will probably be open there in a few days and later some first class plays may be expected. Lenore News 10-15-1907 page 3. The complex architecture for this building leads us through an interesting story of changing uses that continues up to the present day. First, a theater and skating rink on the upper floors of a large livery stable. The performance hall was used for film exhibition as well as theatrical events into the 1920s. During World War I, it served as a barracks for the soldiers headed to Europe. As the livery stables transitioned to an automobile dealership, Caldwell Motor Company, 1919, the upper hall was used as an early basketball court and later a boxing arena. Shaw Furniture Company took over the building in 1942 and the use of the hall as a public venue appears to have ceased. Although not enough information has been collected about the later period of this point to be certain. The glory years of the Hinkle Opera House were roughly 1908 to 1917, and this period is focus here. But the continual use of the building for non-theatrical purposes will be touched on as well as some mention of its present state. The exact location of the building is shown in this redrawn map at the corner of East Main and Mulberry Streets with the courthouse added for reference. By the fall of 1908, skating had apparently ousted film exhibition in the hall, although it would continue to be used for theatrical and vaudeville entertainments of local interest. The moving picture exhibitions which have been given in the Opera House will hereafter be given in the Cloyd and Johnson building on the first floor adjoining the office of Lenore Realty and Insurance Company. The Opera House will be used as a skating rink. Lenore Topic 10-21-1908, page 3. Notices about skating disappear from April 1909 
Lenore News Topic 414, 1909, page 3, until 1915 when motion pictures assert their popularity under the new management of O.P. Lutz. Mr. Lutz will open a skating rink in connection with the Opera House. The skating rink will be open only on nights when no show will be there. Lenore News, 12-14-1915, page 1. Afterwards, other skating rinks in the town take over, and the Opera House was used for other sports. See below. The Opera House is a theater. Only one actual opera was ever advertised for the Hinkle Opera House, and I wouldn't even attempt to pronounce all these operas, so I'll let you read that. Over the past 30 plays performed between 1908 and 1918, almost all included local talent. In some cases, there were directors and or leads of professional stature who worked with locals. In others, students from nearby schools or colleges made up the entire production. Fragile evidence of some in the latter performances was gathered at the Opera House in 2013 with the following inscription in pencil written on a backstage plaster wall thanks to Marty Summerell for this photo. Later in this video, I'll include some photos I took of the W.E. Shaw Building and the Hinkle Opera House taken in 2017. You can also find the video I made of the Hinkle Opera House by googling Hinkle Opera House Bill Tate YouTube Videos. I will try my best to read this fine print for you. This is the last play ever given by Lenore College. The entire coaching and costume work has been directed personally by Miss Honora Detcher, head of the Department of Expression. Neither time nor expense has been spared. The costumes are elaborate, the scenes picturesque, and the cast well trained. Do not miss this opportunity at spending a most pleasant evening. Come and see amateurs play the professionals. More detailed descriptions in the ads and notices for these shows paint a picture of the typical variety shows of the day. Combining musical and dance acts with comedians, magicians, jugglers, acrobats, and other types of entertainment. Occasionally, a further notice from the editorial sections of the newspaper reveals some tension between town moralists and the shows themselves, shows they seem rarely to have attended. The Gibson girls played last Wednesday night to a fair-sized audience composed mostly of men, and that's the Lenore News Topic 217-1909, page 3, and the Vaudeville Company, Gilbert and Dupree's Lady Minstrels, which recently made an engagement here for a week, if reports are true, has failed to make a lavish contribution to the moral, social, or intellectual uplift of the people of the community. Lenore Topic, 1113, 1912, page 3. Although reserved and cryptic, it is worth noting that traveling shows such as this would become less and less common as the Opera House became used as a public venue for amateur events. Events that after 1918 would more likely have taken place in school auditoriums that were increasingly common. Vaudeville, meanwhile, moves to the commercial theaters in town. More common than theater at the Opera House was vaudeville, sometimes in combination with short plays. Here the majority of performances were by traveling professional companies including De Morist Opera Company, January and November 1908, October 1912, Schubert Symphony Club and Lady Quartet of Chicago, April 1908, Colonial Opera Company, April 1908. Madam Hoffman and Professor Talkerton, August 1908. Faisu the Hypnotist, October 1908. Hunter Brothers Comedy Company, 
December 1908, Gibson Girls Musical Comedy Company, February 1909, Happy Jack Zerith and Company, March 1909, Buster Doyle Company, April 1909, The Five Sedgwicks, August 1909, Edward Doors and Company, November 1909, Dixie Comedy Company, December 1909, Gilbert and Dupree's Lady Minstrels, November 1912, Leroy Osborne's Dancing Chicklets, May 1914. Other musical events at the Opera House include Five Fiddlers Conventions, December 1907, December 1908, October 1911, December 1914, December 1929. Three minstrel shows, including one with Polk Miller, March 1910, and then April 1917, August 1919. Seven recitals and concerts from 1909 through 1918. Two Chautauquas, July 1915, September 1918. Over 20 dances from 1909 through 1929. One unusual event in April of 1917 featured the American contralto Ida Gardner testing her voice against a recording of herself on an Edison phonograph sponsored by the Lenore Phonograph Shop. Miss Gardner pleased large Lenore audience. Probably the most convincing test of the program was that of the last number. Miss Gardner was singing in unison with the reproduction of her voice by the new Edison invention when lights were turned off and the audience was asked to distinguish whether Miss Gardner continued to sing or whether it was the instrument. The audience was unable to tell the difference between the human voice and the recreation. The lights were turned on and showed Miss Gardner was not even in the hall. Lenore News, 420, 1917, page 1. The optimistic account of the fidelity of the photograph is balanced by Will England's account of the event where he notes that Gardner sang a quite a bit less than her full voice. Dope by the doper. No one, after hearing the performance, could say that Edison does not truly reproduce the human voice and quality, but the public in general does know that no instrument as yet has been devised which will reproduce the original volume. For this reason, everyone attending the performance would have enjoyed at least one number by Miss Gardner showing the full volume of her voice. After the first piece on the program had been rendered, the audience was convinced that there was no difference in the original quality and the recreation. To prove this, as we understand it, was the object of the concert. Now, Mr. Edison and Mr. Shakespeare, both, are no doubt regular dope readers. When you send Miss Ida around, please let her sing us at least one song, just like she sings in the church choir in New York. Lenore News, 420, 1917, page 4. Other accounts of similar exhibitions from this period are even less flattering, but no doubt there were some in the audience who responded to this commercial exhibition by purchasing a phonograph. Aside from shows dealing with or including music, the Opera House was also used for three lectures from 1909 through 1913, including one accompanied with stereo optican slides. Numerous banquets, meetings, and other civic events were also held in the space into the 1920s. Film exhibition at the Opera House. Possibly because of multiple uses of the venue, film exhibition at Hinkle's Opera House had a relatively brief span. Having rented film from a distributor, exhibitors no doubt wanted to make the most of its use and not wait for skating parties 
or other events to interfere with potential show dates. The first shows in the Opera House were given soon after the building opened in February 1908 and, as noted above, moved to the Cloyd and Johnson Building by late October. The building is located directly across Mulberry. Thus, the Opera House hosted regular film exhibition for a little over eight months. During this period, only seven days have films listed in ads by name. More typical are entries such as these. Of local interest, the Lenore Opera Company is given first-class moving picture shows every night at the Opera House. New attractions each night. Lenore Topic, 6-17-1908, page 3. A rare, more complete notice shows a selection of French films, silent, of course, so the language would not matter. Of local interest, moving picture exhibitions are given at the Opera House Wednesday night and Saturday night of each week. Wednesday and Saturday night's programming will consist of the following pictures. Dr. Scunham, Music Forward, Piker's Dream, Clever Taylor, Wonderful Mirrors, Doings of a Poodle, A Crime in Snow, An Unpleasant Legacy. All of the above are full of fun and can be seen for the small sum of 10 cents. Doors open at 7.30. Lenore News Topic 2, 19, 1908, page 3. Most of the films were made by the French firm, and I won't attempt the pronunciation, and are more typically identified with their original French titles. Music Forward, Clever Taylor, Wonderful Mirrors, Doings of a Poodle, A Crime in Snow, An Unpleasant Legacy. The Dr. Scunham's film is otherwise unknown, but The Piker's Dream, A Racetrack Fantasy, was a Vitagraph short. All of these films were released in late 1907 and only The Piker's Dream and Doings of a Poodle survive today. A similar program in March adds a few more titles to the filmography of the Opera House, again focusing on and another pronunciation I can't handle, shorts. Moving Pictures. The following new moving pictures have been received for tonight and Saturday night by the Opera House Company, Madame Francis. The Unknown Talent, Tipper's Race, Inexhaustible Barrel, On Account of a Lost Collar Button, Little Red Riding Hood, Charlie's Dream, Lenore Topic, 318-1908, page 3. Otherwise, there is only one film named for the rest of the year, The Life and Passion of Christ, which played in May and then returned in July. This, again, was a Pathé production directed by Ferdinand Zecca and was lengthy for the day, 45 minutes. By September, just before leaving the building, the theater appears to have acquired a new name, The Electric Picture Show, as demonstrated by this ad. The Moving Pictures. We are pleased to note that the Electric picture shows given nightly at the Opera House are being well patronized. These entertainments are high-class, innocent diversions and are usually highly entertaining and instructive. The small charge of only 10 cents places the admission in the reach of everybody and we are pleased to note that many persons attend them. They are especially beneficial to children and young persons and others who have never had opportunities of much travel as they present to view interesting scenes in current history and geography and travel and give more accurate ideas of people, customs, and places that can possibly be gotten from reading. The moving pictures are usually good shows that are worth more than the price of admission. Lenore News, 9-4-1917, page 4. This name is kept briefly in the new location where it transitions to either the electric or the electrical theater and eventually is moved to the Harshaw Building in September 1909. After 12 October 1908, regular picture shows, 
took place only in buildings dedicated to, if not built for, film exhibition. These buildings, the Cloyd and Johnson building and the Harshaw building, both adjacent to the Opera House, will be discussed elsewhere on this site. Birth of a Nation, 1917. Several years later, one final film was shown at the Opera House. The important and controversial D.W. Griffith epic, Birth of a Nation, 1915, at an unprecedented $1.50 for an evening ticket. Tickets for The Birth of a Nation after October 15th. The Birth of a Nation will be shown in the Opera House Friday and Saturday, October 26th and 27th, one matinee on Saturday at 2 p.m. Night show commences at 8 p.m. Admission to matinee, one dollar. Nights, a dollar fifty. Lenore News, 10 12, 1917, page 3. This much anticipated event advertised as early as August. The Lenore News, 8 10, 1917, page 3, even reached the Boone newspaper. Watauga Democrat, 10 11, 1917, page 3. It included not only the massive 190 minute film, but also was accompanied by a symphony orchestra of 20 selected musicians. Lenore News, 1023, 1917, page 6. Will England liked the film but complained that the amount of advertising given it should have warranted free passes for the press. A little information about Will England. He had the local small newspaper here in Lenore, North Carolina, the hypodermic, a very political and controversial newspaper. And here is a close-up of the ad for the birth of a nation. Symphony Orchestra of 20 Musicians exactly as shown during record-breaking runs in all the large cities of the world. See Decisive Battles of the Civil War, Sherman's March to the Sea, Grant and Lee at Appomattox, The South Before the War, The Death of Abraham Lincoln, The Rise of the Ku Klux Klan, History in the Making, Mighty story of loves and struggles of the days when the nation was fighting itself. The greatest story ever revealed on any stage. Seats now on sale at Lenore Drugstore. All seats reserved. Prices, nights $1.50, matinee $1. Mail orders when accompanied by self-addressed and stamped envelope with remittance will be promptly filled. Military use, 1917 through 1927. In April of 1917, the United States entered World War I and began a prolonged period of military preparation. The Opera House was called into use later that summer. Cots and blankets shipped to Battery E. 190 cots and 350 blankets were shipped from Supply Headquarters at Raleigh last Friday for Battery E, according to an announcement by Lt. Sanford A. Richardson yesterday. The cots will be placed in the buildings, at the fairgrounds, and in the Opera House for bunking quarters just as soon as they arrive. Lenore News, 8-7-1917, page 3. A complete muster roll of Battery E was printed in the paper later that month. Lenore News, 8-21-1917, page 8. By November, when Birth of a Nation played in the Opera House, the unit was in action in Europe. A National Guard unit moved into the Opera House in the fall of 1925, and the room becomes known as the Armory. It could still be used for non-military purposes, however, as this square dance from the period demonstrates. Square dance, November 11th. There will be an old-fashioned square dance next Wednesday night, November 11th, at the Armory. 
The dancing will begin at 10 o'clock and continue until 2 o'clock. Music will be furnished by a string band and everyone is invited. It is being given under the auspices of the Lenore Company of National Guards. Lenore News Topic 11 5, 1925, page 1. The Jennings Building on West Avenue was called into use as the new armory in 1928, Lenore News, 12 13, 1928, page 1, and thereafter, the Opera House is most commonly referred to as the Armory. The Opera House is a sports arena. After the roller skaters left the Opera House floor for other venues around town around 1915, there were still sporting events held there in 1916. What may be the first basketball game in Lenore was played in November. Lenore and Hickory will play a game of basketball on the Opera House floor Saturday night. Come out and see our boys win. Lenore News, 11 7, 1916, page 4. A similar team of locals played boys from Lenore High School. Lenore News, 11 28, 1916, page 3. And then Lenore High played a team from the Appalachian Training School, now Appalachian State University, Lenore News, 12-5-1916, page 5. Obviously, Lenore High was yet to build a gymnasium. Commencement was even held at the Opera House in 1918. Lenore Topic, 5-8-1918, page 2 and Lenore News 510-1918, page 1. Basketball games between the Lenore Town team, or the high school team, and visiting teams continued through December 1919. Lenore News Topic 1211-1919, page 5. Wrestling was staged in the Opera House as early as 1910. Although its popularity appears to have made it unlikely to have continued for the future. Local matters. A wrestling match was pulled off at the Opera House last Friday night between two traveling athletes and was witnessed by a small audience. Lenore News 8-2-1910, page 3. Wrestling was yet to reach the popularity it gained later in the age of television. Of far more importance was boxing which began at the Opera House in 1929. Fight program is planned for the city. Hedrick and Rudisell plan to stage fight here on April 29th. Arrangements are being made by local fight fans to stage a boxing match here on April 29th, two weeks from today, at which time local talent, pugilistically inclined, will have a chance to display their wares before local people. Doctors Hedrick and Rudisell are promoting the fight. About 35 rounds of fighting, including a climax between two local Negroes, will be on the card which will be presented at the Old Armory located above Caldwell Motor Company. Hal Hartley and Monk Helton, the former scheduled, to fight at Hickory on Hugh Martin's American Legion card. Leather pushers have not yet signed contracts for the fight, but a good card, in fact one that will be the best ever put on in this section of the state, will be given here, it is believed. Lenore News, 415-1929, page 1. Regular boxing matches were held throughout 1929 and most of 1930. Stage all set for boxing show, which will be staged Thursday. Comfortable seats will be arranged in the old armory above Caldwell Motor Company, and the ring is being built on the stage. Indications are that the building will be packed to capacity when the gong sounds. Lenore News Topic 429, 1929, page 2. If the ring was actually on the stage, a lack of typical 360-degree view in most boxing arenas 
would surely have made the Opera House less than appealing as a venue for the sport. This and the popularity of boxing in Lenore led to the search for a larger and better arena, dooming the old Opera House, old armory, to oblivion once again. The Opera House from the 1930s to today. The Caldwell Motor Company continued the use of the theater into the 1930s, but no musical, theatrical events were held there after the 1929 Fiddler's Carnival Convention, Lenore News Topic, 12-9-1929, page 5. The W.E. Shaw Furniture Company took over the building in 1942, and the floor with the theater became the Lenore Recreation Parlor. Miller's Lenore Directory, 1942, page 182 serving primarily as a pool room. There were other recreational pursuits in the building, however, as the following notice makes clear, luck runs out, three nabbed on gambling charge. City police make sudden raid at local recreation parlor Sunday night. Lenore City police officers Following a sudden raid Sunday night, arrested three men in the back room of the Lenore Recreation Parlor and booked charges of gambling against them. The officers patrolling Lenore by night noticed a light in the second-story back room of the establishment located on the corner of East Avenue and Mulberry Street. Procuring a ladder, one police officer, J.G. Bush, climbed up and entered the building while two other officers, W.J. Setzer and Fred Gregg, stood guard at the entrance. Proprietor of the Lenore Recreation Parlor is Hamp Robbins, who told the news topic that he had leased the room in which the alleged gambling took place to John Woods, who operates the concession stand in the Recreation Parlor. Woods admitted to leasing the room from Robbins, but as far as I know, the only card game being played there was Rummy. He was questioned at his concession stand at the hall last night after completing his statement. He pointed to the back room and commented, Somebody's playing Rummy up there right now. Lenore News Topic, 715, 1941, page 1. A similar raid was conducted the next month with six well-known but unnamed men arrested and fined. Lenore News Topic 826, 1941, page 1 and 6. The building was still listed as a billiard parlor in the 1944 directory, page 219, but thereafter seems to have fallen out of use and is not mentioned in the papers. In 2013, Marty Summerell and Gary Boy were allowed to visit the Opera House, which was then above the antique shop. Fittingly, with a history of sports, the room had been equipped up with batting cages for Little League Baseball. We were able to take several photographs. The first photo on the left shows the original flooring and expanse of the room from the back. A second close-up of the stage itself now completely boarded off, and the third what appears to be the original ceiling. There was no electricity in the back stage area, but much of the original electrical equipment remained, as did some plaster walls with graffiti as mentioned above. Some of this graffiti was contemporaneous to the early days of the theater, but more appeared to be from the 1970s and later. I hope this page helps to stir interest in the preservation of the building, which is in need of extensive repairs. Whether from design or neglect, Lenore's Opera House has been preserved for 110 years of radical change and is a rare survivor from long ago. And an update to that, a local Lenore man, Sean Williams, is restoring the old Hinkle Opera House building. Here are the silent theaters to 1926. One, the Hinkle Opera House, 1908 through 1917. Two, the 
2. Cloyd and Johnson Building, 1908 to 1909. 3. Harshaw Building, 1909 to 1913. Shell Building, 1912 to 1913. Jones Hartley Building, 1913 to 1916. Matheson Building, 1914 to 1918, question mark. Masonic Building, 1915, 1922. G. O. Shakespeare Opera House, 1922 through 1955, question mark. Bush Building, 1926, 1949. Here are the Talkies movies. In 1941, Up, State Theater, 1933 through 1955, question mark. Strand Theater, 1941 to 1949, Avon Theater, 1934 through 1979, Center Theater, 1941 through 2000, question mark. The transition of silent movies into the talkie movies happened around 1929-1930. Lenore Theaters by Building, The Bush Building, 1926 through 1949, Caldwell County Courthouse, 1897 through 1947, Cloyd and Johnson Building, 1908 through 1909, Harshaw Building, 1909 through 1913, Hartley Building, 1913, 1916, Jones Building, 1913, Masonic Building, 1915 through 1922, Matheson Building, 1914 through 1918, question mark, Opera House, 1908 through 1917, and that would be the Hinkle Opera House, the Shell Building, 1912 through 1913, and Temporary Theaters, 1906, up. Drive-In Theaters. There were at least four drive-in theaters in Caldwell County beginning in the late 1940s and continuing into the 1950s, where for the time being, my research has ceased. Drums was located near Joyston on the east side of what is now Highway 321. The Lenore Drive-In was located behind Fairway Supermarket in Whitnell, North Carolina at the intersection of Highways 321 and 321A. The Skylight was in Sawmills and the Carolina on 321 near the Valmead School. And I want to add to this that there was the Norris Drive-In, too, that was located in Whitnell. For the first time in my lifetime, and I'm 75, Lenore was without a theater for a couple of years. Now, just recently, here in 2017, we have Golden Ticket Cinemas opening a new theater here in Lenore. And I have saved the articles on that to use in this video. The paint is drying, the sign is going up, tickets are sold, and managers hope chairs are supposed to be installed starting Wednesday. Golden Ticket Cinema's Twin on Morganton Boulevard is scheduled to open Thursday night with three showings of Star Wars, The Last Jedi, one of which was already sold out by Tuesday morning. Work will be going on right up to opening day though, the 280 electric reclining chairs that were supposed to arrive Tuesday are now scheduled to come Wednesday, and then they will have to be assembled and installed. What to do if the chairs don't arrive is a problem theater managers will deal with if it arises, says Chris Sebuvida, who does marketing and communications for Golden Tickets Cinemas, LLC. Carpet was being installed in one theater Tuesday and bathrooms were being completed, but the sound systems, new equipment, and the new curtains were complete. The theater was previously the Carmite Westgate Twin Theater, which closed in December 2014, but while Golden Ticket Cinemas LLC will occupy the same building, the company needs to be a different corporate citizen. We're going to be a part of the community, he said. We really want to build a relationship. The company hopes to mirror what it does in Washington, in coastal North Carolina, 
where its first theater opened last year. There, the theater hosts charity events, partners with local businesses, and tries to customize its movie selection according to local demand. One event they hope specifically to bring to Caldwell is an annual superhero challenge, a charity run in which runners dress as their favorite characters. We see so many different characters. Last year I saw a T-Rex, Velociraptor, Superman, Batman. After the run, which ends at the theater, participants go inside to watch a movie. But the run isn't the only time superheroes visit the theater. The theater wants to regularly bring by local actors dressed as characters for people to take photos with when the movie comes out. Most of all, the theater will be accessible and local. The company is a part of the Caldwell Chamber of Commerce, has a local Facebook page to interact with customers, and may even take requests for movies. We are a theater that isn't a part of the corporate hierarchy, he said. We're in control. Local charities and groups are encouraged to talk to the theater about events or fundraisers they're hoping to do. This from reporter Virginia Annabelle, December 14th, 2017, in the Lenore News Topic. In 1977, Janie Porter waited in line for three hours at Lenore's movie theater to see the first Star Wars. When she found out, the same theater was reopening under a new management after closing in 2014, and the debut movie would be Star Wars The Last Jedi, she was quick to buy tickets online ahead of time. But when she got to the Golden Ticket Cinema, she was told there wasn't a seat for her. In fact, only 50 seats made it to Lenore in time for the opening. Each of the two theaters in the building is supposed to have 80 seats. For Thursday's opening night, I'm a little bit bummed, Porter said, but I have to wait until Monday to see it now. The movie theater sent out emails to tell people that there would be temporary seating, which was to be folding chairs, but the fire marshal said folding chairs wouldn't do. General Manager Joseph Horton said, Two trucks driving from Texas have the rest of the chairs. The electric reclining chairs that did make it were installed Thursday, and the first 50 people to arrive were seated. Those seats were filled by 6.15 for the 7 p.m. showing, leaving about 30 people to get refunds and buy free tickets to any movie and showtime. Horton said the theater had stopped selling tickets for the next showing in time to keep the number under 50. The third planned showing of the night was sold entirely to Google employees and Horton was working out new showtime for them for today. The news given at the ticket counter was met with mostly acceptance and mild disappointment. A few were angry and outspoken. One man yelled for a refund and asked Horton to explain to his three children why they couldn't see Star Wars that night. Another said he didn't care about the refund, only the movie. Sean Moore was among the more understanding there. He said as a business owner, he has had shipments delayed too. We showed up anyway, but we knew we might not get to see it, Moore said. Work was still going on Thursday night on signs and indoor lighting, and there was no popcorn. Another 100 chairs were expected to arrive Thursday at 10 p.m. Horton said that all would be ready and all of the chairs in place for today's 12.30 p.m. showing. And here is the new Golden Ticket Cinema. It just opened. This is the old analog projector. And this is the new digital projector. Power reclining seats. Looks great. Thanks to Golden Ticket Cinemas for sending me these photos to use in this video.